My name is Joe Piverunas. I'm the founder and managing editor of Nanoize. We're a boutique media and research firm that covers disruptive tech for a broad audience of global retail and institutional investors. So today we're going to talk about a synthetic biology company called Zymergen. And we'll start out by talking a bit about the bull thesis here. So Zymergen is one of a number of companies, Ginkgo Bioworks and Amaris being the other notable ones that's using synthetic biology to do some really amazing things. So the advent of SynBio was probably when synthetic genomics created the first synthetic life. So they created a cell, they encoded in that cell's DNA its own email address and a whole bunch of other stuff and everybody's names and credits and all that stuff. And it was really a quite a remarkable achievement. So that ability to create synthetic life now means that we're able to take anything. We could take enzymes, proteins, whatever we want, and start to create new things. So George Church, for example, was working on biofuels. He created an algae that would actually sweat petroleum. So there's a lot of different things that we can now start to use nature to do. So nature is by far the most advanced technology known to mankind. So what we see around us, we don't really understand how a tree can grow from simply just a seed and some sunlight and some water and some nutrients, how we can actually generate that much wood. So the manufacturing capabilities of nature are really quite incredible. Now, companies that have started to exploit synthetic biology platforms will say, all right, we're going to use synthetic biology and AI and automation and robotics, and we're going to start creating enzymes on demand for companies, let's say a company manufactures chemicals, and they use an enzyme in manufacturing a chemical. And if you can produce one that does its job 30% more efficiently, that's a lot of money to be saved there. So it's a industry agnostic value proposition. So these firms say, all right, we're going to set up this platform and we're going to create cool stuff. And there's varying business models that they'll use. So the first one and the least desirable, in our opinion, is selling their own products versus letting others sell their products. So the primary primary example of this was um, in Trexon. In Trexon was a company that was the synthetic biology darling way back when they were developing a Symbio platform and doing all kinds of stuff, dabbling in, in all sorts of industries industries and what they had eventually gotten down to is I remember one of their earnings calls and we were shareholders in the company for a while just based on the the story and we don't invest in stories anymore but it's very tempting sometimes to invest in a story and the gentleman on the call was talking about how much money they were going to make selling these packaged apple slices so they had engineered an apple that that wouldn't brown. And one of the reasons why you can't have packaged apple slices in stores apparently is because they'll brown very quickly and no customer will buy a brown apple slice. So they engineered this apple that didn't brown and they were going to make all this money selling apple slices in gas stations. Is that what you want to invest in when you buy shares of Intrexa? No, you want to invest in their synthetic biology platform. And they're, they were actually so far down the rabbit hole that they were trying to convince investors that there was a lot of money to be made in selling apple slices. So when we look at a firm that has a Symbio platform, we want them to be engineering the enzymes or doing their magic and then letting somebody else take that and run with it. So the other way that you can do this with another, the second type of business model here is revenue from using the platform and then milestone payments down the road. That's what Ginkgo Bioworks does. That's an appealing value proposition. The problem with Ginkgo is that they want investors to believe that a very large chunk of the value in the business is coming from downstream. Now, we always look at revenues as an indicator of a company's traction and promises mean nothing. And the other problem with Ginkgo is that just at least the last time we looked, we've, we did a presentation on them recently, they haven't promised that they're going to break those out so that you can see revenue that's being made up front for use of the platform versus milestone payments coming uh, from down the road. Why is that important? Because without those milestone payments, you can't see if what they're developing is actually commercially viable. And that's the problem we're going to talk about today with Zymergen. And then you have a pure services SaaS offering. So this is like uh, maybe what Twist Bioscience is doing. So they just have a, a services component. And then actually Twist does have some 
um, milestone payment revenues. And that's actually Twist is a good example of when those start to appear. They really should just be a side note and they should be a bonus as opposed to a, a great deal of focus on those down the road. That's a lot of uncertainty. So Ms. Imergen's business model was to develop some products. You can see here, this was their pipeline when they had their IPO. And there's two segments here, electronics and consumer care. And they had developed this high optical film for foldable devices. And you can see them, they were expecting to get revenues from that. They had launched, they were expecting revenues um, last year, I suppose. And then, uh, you know, a second variation of that same film with different applications this year and the following year. And their plan is to manufacture these products, sell them to other businesses that use them as inputs. And then you can see they also have, they're going into, you know, insect protection and things like that. So one can only assume that they're working with clients to engineer these products, but trying to build a better mousetrap, a better quality film for optical devices, that's, that isn't good when the success of your business depends on it. And what happened with Zymergen is exactly that. They, they, they had some uh, severe failings around that product. Now, when we looked at the Zymergen IPO, this was probably the most telling statement. And certainly we give credit to the firm for saying this because it was very important. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe that this was um, made known after the SEC had asked some questions. And it's this, that when they're manufacturing their first product, Hylene, they sourced that, they were producing that from a third party. And they said, we're executing on a process to convert to a fermentation produced molecule, which we expect to occur in 2022. Incredible. So the product that you've built, you're not actually using your synthetic biology platform, this great manufacturing platform to produce. That's a real problem. So you've proved nothing. So what ended up happening, and just based on that alone, that would be a big red flag and you wouldn't touch the stock. So here's what ended up happening. They had their IPO. Things were going well. It traded up to $52 a share. And then you could see where that red arrow is pointing to. That's when some bad news hit and shares dumped. And I think that today they're probably trading around close to 90% lower than their uh, IPO opening price. So what happened? Well, in August of last year, they had a business update conference call and it was dreadful. So firstly, the CEO was terminated and replaced by a gentleman named Jay Flatley, who was chairman of the board and previously did a stint as Illumina CEO and led their growth. So very, um, he comes to the table with some, some great pedigree. Um, but the CEO was terminated. He was also the co-founder. They had updates around Hyaline, their flagship product. So apparently some key target customers had encountered technical issues in implementing this new film. And then they had some emerging data around the total addressable market for the foldable displays that the film was supposed to be targeting and that it was a smaller near-term market opportunity that's growing less rapidly than they had thought. So what, if you listen to that call and the call is about 30 minutes, you very quickly start to get the feeling that the CEO was telling the board one thing and what was actually happening was completely different. And that finally uh, came, became known to the board and now they're talking about bringing in all these third parties to measure this, to get control over that. And, you know, we're going to have these experts evaluate this and, you know, re completely review all the products in our pipeline. So suddenly they're not trusting what they were told before, and they're having to do a complete inventory of their entire business based on what their CEO was telling them before wasn't necessarily accurate, right? So... They have their new CEO and certainly things are seem to be progressing. So they did a um, presentation recently and they talked about how they were going to, you know, be turning the business around and that presentation, uh, just looking to see right now was with, um, it was with JP Morgan at the JP Morgan healthcare conference, interestingly enough. And in that presentation, they talked about how their new plan is now in place and they, you know, reorganize things. They've extended their cash runway, revamped their product pipeline, 
created a strategic plan and all this stuff that they said were, they're going to do, which is great. And then this slide is quite interesting. So suddenly there's talk about developing a drug discovery business. They want to monetize their expertise in automation. So the platform they've built to build things for other people, they want to provide that as a service, similar to the sort of lab automation firms that we've covered before. I don't believe any are public yet, but there are loads of, of um, automation firms that are running quite interesting business models and have been for quite a while. So now Zymergen wants to play in that area as well. They talk about heavy research investment to fuel pipeline. And, you know, this is a firm that's burnt through a billion dollars so far. They have 500 million on their balance sheet. So when they talk about heavy research investments, that's, you know, they, they only have so much dry powder. So they'll certainly need to, to focus on not burning so much cash, at least as much as they have been burning. Then they're talking about focus on near term revenue. That's great. It's what we'd like to see, which would show some traction. And then this last point here at the bottom, ensure culture of teams and trust. Well, this whole trust element keeps coming up when you listen to you know, their presentation and, and what they had to say about what happened. And it really comes down to you know, establishing trust internally and also externally. So a lot of people weren't happy about about what happened and, and they fessed up and now they're turning the firm around and they're focused on three different areas. So that number one here you see is what they were focused on before. It's kind of their old product pipeline with the exception of the 3D printing bit there. They've developed a new 3D printing polymer. And then number two is this drug discovery bit in that healthcare conference they presented at. There were a lot of slides talking about what they're doing in drug discovery. This is potentially new things. We certainly weren't aware of the work they were doing in that area before, so it seems to be a pivot. And then, of course, this third bit, which is also a pivot into automation, and they're going to sell their solution to third parties, and it's based initially on their own internal architecture. So it's kind of starting over, at least when it, when it comes to those, those last two, the drug discovery and automation. They cut, these are kind of new areas they're pivoting into. And then regarding portfolio updates, they talked about how the nitrogen fixation program they have is continuing to advance and they have like 50 sites where they're trialing it. There's mention of their hyaline film that their key partner on polymers is, is working through uh, the, the film bits, right? So they made it a point when they gave that update to say there was nothing intrinsically wrong with the product itself. It was just implementation problems, temporary implementation problems they're, they're having. And then they talked about this additive manufacturing uh, polymer that they're building and then some bio, biodegradable water repellency product and then this mRNA enzyme portfolio. And it's really, these are all things that are you know, showing promise. But again, how long will it be until they're actually able to realize meaningful revenues from any of this? So if Hyaline's taking a while to, that was supposed to be the flagship product and generate revenues this year, and they've said already that we shouldn't expect meaningful revenues this year from Hyaline, will any of the bits in this product portfolio show meaningful revenue from this year? Doesn't really seem likely. Now, when we look at revenue and earnings, well, it's only losses now, right? In terms of how much cash they're burning through. So they have $500 million left in Q3 2021. They had burnt through close to $100 million. So they're going to have to tighten that up fairly quick before they burn through their cash. Now, the fact that they're presenting at the JP Morgan Healthcare Conference is great, and that may be a testament to, to their new leader. But the fact that they burnt analysts and, and Wall Street and, and their investors really badly with what happened last year, that makes it quite a bit more difficult when you go to raise money next time in terms of the terms and investors' willingness to throw money at something that's now now completely pivoted for the most part, uh, or at least the value proposition, a large part of their value proposition now is new. So that may be difficult for the firm to raise money when they need it to invest in their product areas, especially the new product areas. So that's one thing to consider now when they look at 
the platform that they're expanding into this, you know, application specific solutions across industry. They start talking about NGS library prep. That's similar to what Twist Bioscience is doing and drug discovery and SynBio. A lot of buzzwords here and, and, and a lot of potential that they're talking about. And it's almost, it's kind of going back prior to the IPO when, when it's a, a promise of value in the future as opposed to we're having this IPO because now we really need the cash to scale something that's already been proven. So the pivot that, you know, this big pivot they're having isn't overly compelling from our perspective. And in that presentation they gave at JP Morgan, they talk about their proven technology platform. Well, what exactly has been proven here? So we didn't receive confirmation. They actually were ever able to use their own Synbio manufacturing methods to produce this film. So we haven't received any confirmation of that. The film hasn't lived up to its promises. So whatever the reasons are, the, the technical delays or whatnot, you haven't really sold anything yet. What, what exact, exactly has been proven? They talk about hundreds of molecules developed in these successful partners. And sure, you may have developed a lot of molecules. And you know what is a successful partnership? Well, uh, how about a partnership that generates more revenues than we're seeing right now? So the trickle of revenues that's pouring in isn't indicative of any sort of successful platform that people are climbing over each other to try to access. So when they talk about proven technology, that's that seems a bit far fetched. But the the one gem in uh, see the the bright light might be the new chairman and acting CEO. This gentleman was um, working at Illumina. He was it says here is bio right. So he was there as a CEO and took them from 1.3 million in sales to 2.2 billion over 15 years. He has a lot of experience, and it's that sort of experience growing a company that's extremely valuable. Now they say they're out hunting for a CEO and that's great, but it's much better if this gentleman right now is turning the ship around and, and, and pushing them in the right direction. So that's uh, that's a bit promising. Now, in, in terms of our perspective of Zymergen, there's, there's people that would say, well, I, right now is a, a great time to climb into some shares, right? So um they're what you know 90 percent discount well here's the thing on that so they have a 488 million dollar market cap we don't invest below a billion and they came from being a 4.4 billion dollar company to where they're at today they've entered the death zone so we look at companies that fall below meaningfully below a billion dollar market cap to be in in somewhat trouble. So first of all, we won't invest in anything <clears throat> that's below a billion dollar market cap. But we also see that companies that start to get down to that size, they need to get out of there fast. So this pivot that they're talking about is going to take some time. In the meantime, we have a market that's showing some signs of, of correction. And when that happens, all that money, that freely available money suddenly starts to dry up. That's a problem. In terms of measuring their progress going forward, well, first of all, they need to get out of the, the death zone. But once, once they do, they need to show traction, that their new plan has some traction based on revenue growth. That's the only, it doesn't matter what you're told by a firm, it all comes down to revenues. Is somebody willing to pay for what they're building, what they're selling? So we need to see revenue growth. We need to see the company get out from the, out of the death zone and then the other thing that's useful would be to see granularity by revenue segment. So they talked about their product portfolio, drug discovery, and then automation. Well, it would be great to see those segmented. And of course, they can't segment those until they actually have meaningful revenues. But instead of balling everything together into one group, it would be nice to be able to see the progress by segment. So that would be useful. And then you know, below here, this chart you see is the year to date performance. What we're 20, well, we're one month into 2022 now. Uh, so they've fallen 28% in the last month. Now you need to uh, measure that against a benchmark. We like to use just the QQQ, it's very simple. NASDAQ, uh, NASDAQ ETF tra attracts the top 100 in NASDAQ. And 
you can subtract that from Zymergen's return. So really Zymergen has fallen 14% because if the entire tech market also has been falling, then that needs to be taken into account. However, the stock is continues to crater and we don't like trying to catch falling knives and we wouldn't buy this at any price because we don't invest in teams with dreams. We, in we invest in quality businesses that have traction and that are showing meaningful revenues. So Zymergen isn't a firm that we would ever consider investing in the way they sit today. We'll probably come back and take a look at them should they start to, to bring in some meaningful revenues from these other areas they've pivoted in and if they get outside the $1 billion or say above the $1 billion market cap. So that's about all we have to say about that. Thanks for taking your time. If you subscribe to our YouTube channel, we'll be putting out new videos. You can also check out the description where we've linked to articles that we've written on Zymergen, both prior to their IPO and afterwards. And um, thank you very much for taking the time to join us today. We'll be putting out the next video on Symbio will be on uh, Amaris. Uh, so thank you very much for your time.